Thank you, everyone, for being here. I would like to thank the Educational Bookshop for making this meeting possible. And I would quickly like to thank three people without whom the book would not exist. Obviously, Carl Sabah, my publisher. Radha Karmi, whose uh, latest excellent book, Return, is, I'm sure, available upstairs. She pretty much inspired the book and was an asset throughout the project. And my partner, Nancy Elan, who was my constant alter ego throughout the project and without whom I surely would have given up. Our topic is, of course, the so-called conflict in Israel-Palestine, a word I will continue to use for convenience, even though it's not really an accurate word. This is a tragedy that has dragged on for so long that it feels static, it feels almost normalized. But unlike other deadly conflicts in the world, this one is wholly in our power to stop. Now, the word our, I am speaking for myself as both a United States and an EU citizen. It is in our power to stop it because we, we are the ones empowering it. And again, the we means the United States and the EU. We are now approaching the centennial of the British original sin in this conflict, obviously the Balfour Declaration. The British role in Palestine was a case of hit and run. The Balfour Declaration, in which the British gave away other people's land, was the hit. And UN Resolution 181, the partition resolution, was the run, leaving the Palestinians abandoned in a ditch as the British fled the scene of the crime. Both Balfour and Resolution 181 were scams. The Balfour Declaration deliberately concealed the actual intentions of the Zionists, and Resolution 181 rewarded years of relentless Zionist terrorism and, in the process, enabled Britain to extricate itself from the catastrophe it helped create. This 134-year-old conflict and I, of course, am dating it from the beginning of Zionist colonization, is so simple that it takes only one sentence to explain it. The only way to dispossess a native pop population from their land, from their homes, from their lives, is by violence against that civilian population, what we call terrorism. That's the whole story. All the alleged complications of the conflict serve merely to obscure that simple core reality. Zionism was, of course, among the incarnations of racial nationalism that evolved in the late 19th century. Its biggest fans were bigots. Early observers all noted that it was the anti-Semites that championed the Zionists. For example, Gertrude Bell, the famous English writer, traveler, archaeologist, spy, she reported that based on her firsthand experience, those who supported Zionism did so because it provided a way to get rid of Jews. The London Standards correspondent to the first Zionist conference in 1897, I think, put it perfectly. I will quote from him. He wrote, the degeneration which calls itself anti-Semitism, now bear in mind that anti-Semitism was then a very new term, has begotten the degeneration which adorns itself with the name of Zionism. Most Jews and most Jewish leaders dismissed Zionism as the latest anti-Semitic cult. They had fought for equality, and they resented being told that they were now to, to make a new ghetto, and worse yet, to do so on other people's land. They resented being cast as a separate race of people, as Zionism demanded. They had had quite enough of that from non-Jewish bigots. For others, however, the idea of going to a place where one could act out racial superiority was seductive. As the political theorist Edward Bernstein put it, about the time the Balfour Declaration was being finessed, the ethno-national movement of Zionism is, I quote from him, a kind of intoxication which acts like an epidemic. By the time of the Balfour Declaration, the British and the Palestinians knew that the Zionists fully intended to ethnically cleanse the land for a settler state based on racial superiority. 30 plus years of Zionist settlement had demonstrated this, and it was the behind the scenes demands of the principal Zionist leaders, notably Chaim Weizmann and Baron Rothschild. First hand accounts of the Zionist settlement in Palestine before Balfour paint a picture of violent 
racial displacement. I will cite one that, that's not so well known. Dr. Paul Nathan, a prominent Jewish leader in Berlin, went to Palestine on behalf of the German Jewish National Relief Association. He was so shocked by what he found that he posed a pamphlet in January 1914 in which he described the Zionist settlers as carrying on, I quote, a campaign of terror modeled almost on Russian pogrom models. A few years later, the Balfour Declaration's deliberately ambiguous wording was being finalized. Skeptics were assured that it did not mean a Zionist state, and the Declaration itself seemed to insinuate that no harm would come to the Palestinians. Yet simultaneously, behind the scenes with the British, Weizmann was pushing to create that very state immediately. He demanded that it extend all the way to the Jordan River within three or four years of the Declaration, that is by 1921, and then expand beyond it. Jewish settlers, Weizmann insisted, must be accorded special privileges over the Palestinians, and the British authorities must lie about the whole scheme until it is too late for anybody to do anything about it. He and Rothschild, by the way, repeatedly complained to the British that the Jewish settlers Settlers were not being treated preferentially enough over the Palestinians. In their behind-the-scenes meetings, Weizmann, Rothschild, and the British officials treated the ethnic cleansing of non-Jewish Palestinians as indispensable to their plans. In correspondence with Balfour, Weizmann justified his lies by slandering the Palestinians and by slandering Jews that is, the Middle East's indigenous Jews who were overwhelmingly opposed to Zionism. These Jews he slandered with, with classic anti-Semitic stereotypes. The Palestinians he dismissed as, an, in so many words, being a lower type of human. And this was among the reasons he and Zionist leaders always invoked for refusing simple democracy in Palestine. If the Arabs had a vote, he said, it would lower the Jew down to the level of a native, native his word. With the establishment of the British mandate, four decades of peaceful Palestinian resistance had proven futile, and armed Palestinian resistance, which included terrorism, began. Zionist terror evolved at the same time into formal militias that attacked anyone in the way of its messianic goals, Palestinians, Jews, or British. The Zionist terror gangs in contrast to the Palestinian gangs, operated from within their settlements and were actively empowered and shielded not just by the settlements themselves, but by the Jewish agency, the semi-autonomous government of the settlements, which would become, of course, the Israeli government. There was no substantive difference between the acknowledged terror organizations, most famously the Irgun and Lehi, the so-called Stern Gang, and the Jewish agency and its terror gang, the Haganah. The agency cooperated, collaborated, and even helped finance the Irgun. The relationship between the Jewish agency's Haganah and the Irgun and Lehi was symbiotic. The Irgun in particular would act on behalf of the Haganah so that the Jewish agency could feign innocence. The agency <coughs> would then tell the British that they condemned the terror while steadfastly refusing any cooperation against it, indeed doing what they could to shield it. I should point out, in fact, that the most deadly terror attack of the entire Mandate period was not, as is commonly thought, the Irgun's bombing of the King David Hotel in 1946. In fact, even some of the Irgun's terror attacks on Palestinian markets killed more people than the King David bombing. But the most deadly single terror attack of the Mandate was the Jewish agency's own bombing of the immigrant vessel Patria in 1940, killing an estimated 267 people, of whom more than 200 were Jews fleeing the Nazis. The Patria was to bring the DPs to Mauritius, where the British had facilities for them. Now, the Zionists justify this on the grounds that the agency was trying to make the DPs settle in Palestine, where they were needed demographically for Zionist political ambitions, and they hadn't meant to kill them. But this is an immoral argument even if by some miracle no one had been hurt. The fact is that the Jewish agency placed their settler project above the lives of the Jewish survivors. And this was no aberration, but the constant driving force of Zionism. 
There was a similar case, in fact, in 1947, the Empire Lifeguard, which the Jewish agency blew up, not even for the fundamentalist reason of the patria, but just as a smear to the, to the British, uh, to, to sneer at them because it was a British vessel. That sneer meant more than the lives of the, of the immigrants. Britain allowed the survivors of the patria to remain in Palestine, and so the bombing ultimately served its purpose. The fascist nature of the Zionist enterprise was apparent both to US and to British intelligence. The Jewish agency tolerated no dissent and sought to dictate the fate of all Jews. And the radicalization of children was the methodology of all three gangs, with the 8th of July, 1938, being a particularly rude wake-up call to the British regarding the indoctrination of children. That day, the Irgun blew up a bus filled with Palestinian villagers. Now, this was not the first time the Irgun had blown up a bus with Palestinian villagers. But this time, the British caught the bomber. She was a 12-year-old schoolgirl. Teenagers, both boys and girls, were commonly used to plant bombs in Palestinian markets and conduct other terror attacks. Teachers were threatened or removed if they tried to intervene in the indoctrination of their students. The students themselves had their achievement blocked if they resisted involvement. They were taught to betray their parents if those parents tried to instill some moderation. And Jews who opposed or tried to warn of the emerging, fasc emerging fascism were assassinated. And in fact, most victims of Zionist assassination, which is to say targeted rather than indiscriminate, were Jews. From the beginning of World War II through to the summer of 1947, there were all but zero Palestinian attacks, even though Zionist terror against the Palestinians continued. There is no record of, of the number of Palestinian victims of Zionist terror during that period, except that the British occasionally con confirmed that it continued. Random Palestinians being knifed to death on the seashore by Zionist terrorists was a method commonly mentioned. The British explanation for the Palestinians' failure to respond in kind, again during this period, we're not talking about the 1930s, was that they understood that the attacks were intended to elicit a reaction that the Zionists would frame as an attack against which they needed to defend themselves. This was a Zionist tactic that the British observed as early as 1918, and it of course remains Israel's default strategy today, most blatantly in Gaza, but also in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. As late as the fall of 1947, the Jewish agency was concerned by the Palestinians' failure to respond to the terror. When the end of 1947 came and the Zionists could wait no longer for the civil war it needed to conduct their ethnic cleansing campaign, it was simply a matter of ratcheting up the terror until it produced the desired effect. To demonstrate the continuity between the duplicity of the Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate and the Jewish Agency, I will summarize a key meeting of 20 people held in London on the 9th of September 1941. Uh, this is paraphrased from page 72 in this book. To be treated as most secret is the reading heading accompanying the transcript. Present were Weizmann, who had called the meeting, Ben Gurion, and other Zionist leaders, such as Simon Marx of Marx and Spencer, and the prominent non-Zionist <coughs> industrialist Robert Whaley Cohen. Discussing the path to the proposed Jewish state, the conversation ran along the lines of George Orwell's still to be published Animal Farm, in which all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Anthony the Rothschild began by stressing that there would be, quote, no discrimination against any group of its citizens in the Jewish state. Not even, quote, to meet immediate needs. Weizmann and Ben-Gurion also assured the skeptics, Arabs, Palestinians, would have equal rights. However, they clarified that within that absolute equality, Jewish settlers would have to have special privileges. Weizmann's absolute equality included the transfer of most non-Jews out of Palestine while permitting, quote, a certain percentage of Arab and other elements 
to remain in his Jewish state, the insinuation being, of course, as a pool of cheap labor. Anthony the Rothschild's vision of equality and non-discrimination, not even to meet immediate needs, was equally compelling. It, quote, depended on turning an Arab majority into a minority. And to achieve this, there would be, quote, no equal rights for non-Jews. Cohen, the industrialist, found the scheme dangerous. He submitted that the Zionists were, and I quote him, starting with the kinds of aims with which Hitler had started. Cohen did not stop there. He suggested that, well, if you really intend a state with equality for everyone, the state should have a neutral geographic term, maybe Palestine, not a religious one that, that denoted one on the base of race or religion. The others refuted Cohen. They argued that if the state had a non-Jewish name, quote, they would never get a Jewish majority, in effect acknowledging the use of messianism as a calculated strategy. In another obvious but rarely spoken admission, Ben-Gurion clar clarified that the Jewish state was not based on Judaism. It was rather based on being a Jew, that is to say, by his racial definition. Asked about the borders of his settler state, Weizmann continued in the same surreal manner. He replied that he would consider the Peel Commission's partition plan. Now, four years earlier, the Peel Commission had been the first to propose a formal plan for partition. Weizmann would continue, would, would um, consider the Peel Commission's partition plan, but he said the line, that is the partition, would be the Jordan. Now, this was nonsense. The Jordan was the Peel Commission's border for both states. So Weizmann's partition meant 100% for his state and 0% for the Palestinians. He went further still. He would, quote, very much like to cross the Jordan, that is, to take Transjordan along with Palestine. At the end of the meeting, Weizmann sought to put his proposals into effect immediately in the name of all Jews worldwide. Those against his proposals were, in his word, anti-Semites. Meanwhile, of course, World War II was raging. What was the Jewish agency's reaction to the most terrible enemy Jewry has ever known? From the beginning, it was to lobby the Yishuf, the, um, the Jewish settlers in Palestine, not to enlist in the Allied struggle against the Nazis, because doing so would not serve Zionism. Um, the Jewish agency even took advantage of May Day 1940, when the war was a half year old, to lecture the Yishuf not to enlist. Another reaction of the agencies to the most terrible enemy Jewry has ever known was to conduct a massive theft ring of Allied weapons and munitions, as if, as one military record put it, paid by Hitler himself. Much has been written about the collaboration between the Zionists and the fascists during the war, the best known, of course, being the Havar transfer agreement that broke the anti-Nazi boycott. I will cite one of the least known attempted collaborations because it offers a comparison between Lehi, the most fanatical of the terror gangs, during the war and the Israeli state a decade later. In late 1940, Lehi almost concluded what it called the Jerusalem Agreement with the Italian fascists. Now, the, the gist of this, of this agreement would have been that the fascists would be helped by Lehi to win the war. Lehi would help the fascists. After the war, if the fascists were victorious, they would use their military might to destroy all Jewish communities not in Palestine and forcibly transfer their populations to Palestine. Now, if this sounds like a, a scheme so crazy that only Lehi could have conjured it, it is exactly what the Israeli state did in the early 1950s. It used its force to destroy, most successfully, the ancient Jewish community in Iraq and move its population to Israel as ethnic fodder. German Jewish immigrants to Palestine during the war were outraged by the Zionist exploitation of the Nazi horrors they had just fled. This outrage was given voice by, among others, the prominent journalist Robert Welch. He had been editor of a newspaper in Berlin until it was banned by the Nazis in 1938. 
Welch warned that Zionist leaders, and I quote him, have not yet understood that the enemy seeks the destruction of the Jews. We, who have been here in Palestine only a few years, we know what Nazism is. The Zionists, he said, and I quote him, are taking part in the crash of European Jewry only as spectators. They are fighting the British and keeping Jews from joining the Allied struggle while getting comfortable and rich from their political project in Palestine. Recent immigrants from Germany and Central Europe, he said, have no representation among the Zionist ruling establishment. If they did, and I quote him again, we would have demanded that the Yishuv should put itself at the disposal of Britain for the fight against Hitler and Nazism. But, and I still quote him, they, the, um, the Zionists, do not want to fight against Hitler because his fascist methods are also theirs. They do not want our young men to join the Allied forces. Day after day, they are sabotaging the English war effort. These German Jewish immigrants were shunned by the Zionists. Their publications and their presses bombed. And even kiosks were bombed for selling non-Hebrew papers to German Jewish immigrants. In 1943, a man whom <coughs> British records describe as, quote, a Jew whose integrity is not open to question, risked his life to warn the British about the threat of Zionism. When I say Zionism, of course, I'm always referring to the political Zionism as, as espoused by the Jewish agency, not to one might call spiritual Zionism, which is nobody's business. For his safety, this, this, uh, this person who came forward is referred to in the documents only by the code name Z. Z described Zionism as a parallel movement to Nazism, and he warned that the Zionist indoctrination of Jewish youth was producing a society of fanatics who will use any method to achieve the Zionist goals. And he said, as Nazism has already demonstrated, such a society is very difficult to undo once it has taken root. And I'm afraid that is what we are experiencing in the so-called conflict today. How trustworthy is this testimony from an anonymous person? Well, I found at the National Archives in Britain, I found a private letter in which Z is identified. He was J.S. Bentwich, who was the senior inspector of Jewish schools in Palestine. Zionist violence against Jews was often accomplished passively, quote unquote, without bombs. One such major tactic was the sabotaging of safe haven for the war's survivors in order to force them to Palestine. U.S. President Roosevelt's efforts on behalf of the war's DPs is a well-documented example. As the death camps were liberated and other survivors came out from hiding, Roosevelt put together a large-scale initiative to get new safe homes for a half million DPs. 150,000 would go to the United States, the same number would go to Britain, and 200,000 would go to South America and Australia. In February of 44, as the second blitz hit London, Roosevelt sent his aide, Morris Ernst, to London to clinch the deal, and was successful. Morris Ernst returned to Washington he and Roosevelt celebrated the good news. A week later, the deal was dead. Zionist leaders in the United States sabotaged it. Ernst, who, by the way, was Jewish, he was devastated. He was determined to rescue the program, and so he started to visit these Zionist leaders in the United States. But in his words, he was, quote, thrown out of parlors and accused of treason. Treason, that is, for offering an alternative to settlement in Palestine. Nor were Jewish DPs already settled safe. Orphans of Jewish background who had been adopted by European families when their parents perished were another problem for the Zionists. For Yitzhak Herzog, who was the, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Palestine, the solution to these children was to kidnap them. In 1946, he toured Europe to track down the children and forcibly remove them from their adoptive families 
so they could be put back in orphanages awaiting their shipment to Palestine as demographic facts on the ground. 10,000 children was the number he cited as his goal. At every step, however, he encountered stiff resistance by the horrified local Jewish leaders, all of whom tried to protect the children. But Herzog used his political clout to expose the children when possible. In France, for example, he faced the steadfast refusal of the local Jewish leaders to betray the children. Herzog, and I will read a quote from his own records, Herzog met the Prime Minister of France from whom I demanded the promulgation of a law which would oblige every family to declare the particulars of the children it houses." Unquote. That's pretty spooky stuff. This was in order to expose those children who were Jewish so they could be removed. Quite a Kafkaesque twist on Passover for these children who had just been spared the Nazis. Herzog's justification for the kidnappings was that for a Jew to be raised in a non-Jewish home was, quote, much worse than physical murder. Yet even this fails to explain what was actually taking place, because at the same time Herzog was rescuing Jewish orphans from this fate much worse than physical murder, his Jewish agency colleagues were sabotaging 1,000 Jewish adoptive homes in England for young Jewish survivors still in the camps. <laughs> the real reason for all of it, of course, was that the children were needed to serve the settler project as demographic fodder. The principal reason the agency had such control over the DPs was another example of this passive violence. After the war, the agency coerced then-President Truman to force the segregation of Jewish DPs into Zionist-run camps independent of Allied control. And uh, by the way, even Churchill, who was staunchly Zionist, even Churchill was squeamish about this, saying that we had just fought a war to stop this sort of behavior. The camps were run by the agency and other Zionist organizations, including the Irgun. These were, in effect, Zionist brainwashing camps. And for these refugees who had just survived the unthinkable, and now to be severed from the rest of humanity, there was no such thing as free thought. Anyone who voiced any deviation from the Zionist program and the desire to go anywhere but Palestine was ostracized, their rations were reduced, and when necessary, subjected to physical violence. The best statistics that we have suggest that immediately after the war, very few Jewish DPs wanted to go to Palestine. They wanted to go to the United States. They wanted to go to Great Britain. Some of them hoped maybe they could stay in Europe. But the degree of Zionist totalitarian control over the survivors was already apparent in 1946, when a joint US-UK committee visited the camps. They were greeted, as the committee described it, by the DPs in a delirious state of fear, threatening mass suicide unless they were sent to Palestine immediately. The committee, taken aback, suggested, well, what about someplace else? Maybe, maybe the United States? What if, what if we get you new homes in the United States? Would you consider that? The DPs reacted in terror and promised that if you try to send us to the United States, we will commit mass suicide. The Jewish agency, meanwhile, discussed its enemies. These enemies included democracy, the Atlantic Charter, which of course became the basis for the United Nations, reconstruction, and the fall in anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, of course, had always been Zionism's drug, without which it would be irrelevant. The agency blamed declining anti-Semitism in America on what it referred to as America's democratic attitude. Now today, when anything approaching this topic is raised, it is twisted by some into the maturative misstatement that the speaker, in this case me, is blaming Jews for anti-Semitism. Rather, it is the simple fact that Zionism requires anti-Semitism and seeks to ensure that it, or at least the appearance of it, never ends. One need look no further than the satisfaction 
among many Zionists today at the true anti-Semitism of the incoming US administration of Donald Trump. And we have, for example, the Israeli media personality and journalist Yaron London, publishing articles about how the, Trump's, the Trump administration's anti-Semitism is good news because it might force more Jews to move here when they certainly won't move here just for the love of Israel. More about that in a couple of minutes. Now, I also mentioned Reconstruction. As one former settlement member, a man named Newton, explained, Zionist leaders were afraid that with the improvement of conditions in Europe, the pressure on Palestine would subside. And so it pushed a policy of non-cooperation with Reconstruction. Any improvement in Europe was an anathema to their plans. The war against the Nazis had devastated Britain's economy, and so Britain turned to the United States for a long-term loan. The agency saw this as an opportunity for extortion, to use its influence in the United States to pressure Washington to deny the loan to Britain unless Britain acceded to Zionist demands. Now, the loan was, of course, ultimately approved, but the Truman administration itself dangled in front of British officials the threat of rescinding this loan when some British officials tried to bring attention to Zionist atrocities in 1948. By 1946, Zionist terrorism had become the defining daily challenge of life in Palestine. Now, there's no point right now by giving you an inventory of of these terror attacks. Uh, I must say that this book, a good chunk of it, is almost just that. But uh, suffice to say that 100,000 British troops proved unable to contain it. Anyone or anything that kept Palestine a functioning society was a target of the Zionists. So trains, roads, bridges, communications, oil facilities were constantly being bombed. Utility workers, telephone repairmen, railway workers, bomb disposal personnel were murdered. Police were a favored target and were gunned down by the dozens. Typically, they were shot in the back, the terrorist then slipping into a nearby settlement where he would be protected. Another major technique was to call a false alarm of some incident in a house. The police would enter the house, and then the house would be rigged with explosives and would be bombed. By 1948, biological warfare made its debut in the Jewish agency's arsenal. Among the smaller terror organizations that popped up around this time was one specifically dedicated to Zionists' long-running fear of Jews befriending non-Jews. The ultimate fear, of course, being the risk of impurities in what for the Zionists was the Jewish race. As a sample of its methods, this terror group whose name translated to something like the stoppers of the epidemic, doused a disobedient Jewish girl with acid, severely wounding her and blinding her in one eye. By 1946, railways, which had been a constant target of the Zionists in Palestine, were now targeted in Europe, the bombers being DPs groomed in the Zionist-run camps. What would have been the most horrific of all the Zionist train bombings happily failed. In the summer of 1947, a train carrying civilians and returning Allied soldiers was bombed as it traversed a mountain pass high in the Austrian Alps. Now, the bombers intended to blow the train off of the steep trestle into the abyss, killing everyone aboard. But although a preliminary bomb exploded as intended, it failed to detonate the main bomb, and so the train was was kicked off the tracks, but was not blown off of the trestle. Coast Guard stations were also a favorite target. And to demonstrate the degree to which the Jewish agency plants infiltrated the government and everyday life, a couple of months after one Coast Guard station was attacked and bombed, it blew up again. But the British were baffled because there had been no attack. It just blew up. They discovered that the construction crew that had rebuilt the station after the previous attack were Haganah, and they had simply embedded explosives in the construction to be detonated whenever, they, whenever the mood hit them. 
But the worst problem of infiltration was in the military service, where deadly sabotage by scientist plants who had joined the forces led, tragically, to orders to remove all Jews from service because there was no way to tell the Zionists from the Jews. By 1948, this problem spread to key medical personnel. After the Jewish agency poisoned the water supply of Acre with typhoid in order to expedite the ethnic cleansing of that city, which, by the way, lay on the Palestinian side of partition, the bacteriologist hired by the British proved to be a Haganah plant or at least a sympathizer because he proved to be an obstacle to the availability of the vaccine. Zionist terror was aided by the Jewish agency's phenomenal intelligence network. The agency had agents everywhere, from post office employees sorting the mail to high-placed sympathetic US officials that fed them intelligence, such that the British learned, for example, not even to trust direct messages to US President Truman. When the UN sent its Palestine Committee, UNSCOF, that would decide Palestine's future, to Palestine in the summer of 1947, the agency had already replaced the committee members' drivers with spies, had replaced the waiters in the main restaurant they frequented with spies, and most productively, they sent five girls to be so-called house attendants at the building where all the members, who were all men, were being housed. These girls were selected on the basis of being smart and educated, but above all, they had to be, in the agency's word, daring. Now, what daring meant is not explained, but the young women extracted a wealth of information about the committee members and their deliberations. Jewish sex workers, whose clientele were predominantly British, were involuntarily recruited as spies. They were told that upon the Zionist victory, they would be executed for, for sleeping with the enemy, but might be spared if they cooperated now. The practice was so widespread that a regular questionnaire was printed up and distributed to the women that they were to fill out after each customer. Selling terror required effective marketing. And for a glimpse into how the agency harnessed the plight of European Jews at the same time as it was exploiting them, let's take a look at the iconic Zionist immigrant story of the pre-state period, which of course was the USS Warfield, renamed by the Zionists the Exodus for the obvious biblical iconography. This was sold to the world as the desperate attempt of 4,515 survivors of the late war to reach their last hope of safety and a new life, their promised land. The British instead forced them back, not just to Europe, but forced them back to their ultimate nightmare, Germany. That, at least, was the story the US and the European public got. In truth, the exodus was a monstrous propaganda event. It was grand theater, not for the benefit, but at the expense of Jewish survivors. The Jewish agency knew perfectly well that the exodus passengers would be turned back. The absorptive capacity of, of Palestine was already stretched, and the Zionist flooding of Palestine with settlers was a political tactic to force the creation of a Zionist state. <coughs> Further, at the same time the agency was framing the exodus as the DP's last hope of survival, it was using British landing permits intended for the DP's on healthy, well-financed settlers from the United States and from the United Kingdom. The DPs themselves, of course, were the products of the Zionist-run camps and had been rehearsed to repeat, as one witness described it, whatever Zionist mumbo-jumbo was demanded of them. As we have already seen, it was the Zionist leaders that sabotaged better futures for the DPs in order to prolong the heart-wrenching spectacle of homeless refugees. As for the return to Germany, it was the Jewish agency not the British, that forced them back to Germany. Attempts were being made to find new homes for the Exodus passengers elsewhere. Denmark was a good possibility, but these were sabotaged by Ben-Gurion because it would spoil the Exodus plot. The agency, however, had a bigger problem on its hands than the possible homes in Denmark. 
because there was already an alternative to Germany for all the Exodus DPs. The three vessels that were returning the Exodus passengers to Europe all stopped in southern France, and all the DPs had the right to disembark and stay in southern France. Not ideal, but for most of them, it would have been far preferable than returning to Germany. To prevent this plot breaker, the agency used violence to stop the DPs from leaving. While the ships were still in southern France, the British decide to call the Jewish agency's bluff. They went to visit Golda Meir, whose name was then Meyerson. The British pretended as though it went without saying that the Jewish agency would do anything to spare the DPs this horrific return to Germany. So they suggested that maybe the DPs are unaware that they have this option, or maybe they don't believe the British. So why doesn't the Jewish agency send a representative to tell them that, that they're free to do this if they wish? Golda Meir scoffed at them and said that if they do not go to Palestine, they will go to Germany. To paraphrase the Israeli professor Edith Zertal, the greater the suffering of these survivors of the Holocaust, the greater their political and media effectiveness for the Zionists. A few months after the Exodus affair, the UN recommended partition with the assumption that the Zionist state would follow. This was directly influenced by their fear of continuing Zionist terror, as was the disproportionately large land area that the UN gave the Zionists. According to British cabinet papers, giving the Zionists so much land up front was an attempt to delay, not stop, but delay the Zionist expansionist wars that the decision makers knew would come. This appeasement, of course, failed because within a few months of Resolution 181, the Zionist armies were already waging their first expansionist war, confiscating more than half of the Palestinian side of partition. In a consummately Orwellian irony, however, the fact that the British were occupying Palestine enabled the Zionist leaders to juxtapose their settler project as a liberation movement against the British colonizers. And so, for their 1948 campaign of expropriation and ethnic cleansing, did respond instead as a war of independence or emancipation. This so-called war of independence was, to quote the High Commissioner of um, Palestine at the time, Cunningham, quote, operations based on the mortaring of terrified women and children. The Jewish agency's broadcasts boasting of their successes, to quote Cunningham, both in content and in manner of delivery are remarkably like those of Nazi Germany. The Jews, he said, are still jubilant and still busy with their campaigns of calculated aggression coupled with brutality. British intelligence, meanwhile, reported that the internal machinery of the Jewish state, this is pre-May 15th, and all the equipment of a totalitarian regime is complete, including a custodian of enemy property to handle Arab lands. British intelligence continued that in the Yisha itself, persecution of Christian Jews, which, by which I assume they mean converts, and others who offend against the national discipline has shown a marked increase and in some cases has reached medieval standards. All this, to be sure, is before any Arab army entered the area. Finally, on the 15th of May, 1948, the British fled the scene of the crime for which the Palestinians have been paying ever since. The post-statehood period continued full throttle with the same violent messianism evolving with the new dynamics. Now, there's no point my having, having taken up your time here, no point any tree wasting its paper on this book, unless I thought that it had some value in the collective effort toward ending the conflict. So, how do I think that this book, that my approach, might be, might be constructive? The historical record makes plain that Israel's and Zionism's pretenses regarding Jews and Judaism, and in particular, its pretenses of being an answer 
to anti-Semitism and Jewish persecution is a fraud. Indeed, quite the opposite, it thrives by exacerbating and capitalizing on these and has turned them into a cynical business. Exposing this, in my opinion, is Israel's Achilles heel. The US and other governments empower the conflict for their own geopolitical reasons, but why do the public of these allegedly democratic countries give their tacit acquiescence? Israel has one of the largest militaries, but its most powerful weapon, the one without which all its others would be impotent, is its narrative, its creation myth, its, its autobiography. Under the twilight zone of this narrative, Israel is not merely a political entity like any other nation state, but it is transformed into the reincarnation of the Old Testament kingdom whose name it adopted for this very purpose, striking a powerful chord in the collective Western subconscious. We all know the narrative more or less, but in order for that narrative, narrative to be ever present, Israel has crammed it into a three word mantra, the Jewish state. This phrase, Israel's self-identity, is a unique construct in the modern world. It is, it is qualitatively distinct from any other country's relationship with any other religion or cultural tradition. Judaism is not merely Israel's state religion in the sense of a national faith that any nation might adopt. Rather, it presents itself as the Jewish state, the metaphysical embodiment of Jews, Judaism, Jewish history, culture, persecution, and most cynical and exploitative of all, the Holocaust. No country claims it is the Catholic state. Costa Rica is a Catholic state. It does not suggest that it owns Catholicism, Catholics, or historic Christian martyrdom. Norway is a Lutheran state. Tunisia maintains Islam as a national faith. Israel, in contrast, would never acknowledge even the possibility of another Jewish state because it has body snatched everything Jewish. Israel wields this three-word bullet, the Jewish state, as a human shield to empower its crimes. Criticize Israeli terror, you will instead hit this three-word human shield that Israel hides behind. If we, for example, were to criticize the actions of Cambodia, it would never cross anybody's mind to accuse us of being an anti-Buddhist bigot. The narrative and the three-word human shield silence those seeking to bring peace. Exposing this should be a simple case of the emperor's new clothes, except that every time the child points out that the emperor is naked, he or she is called an anti-Semite and silenced. We hear a lot about anti-Semitism these days, and to be sure, there is of course anti-Semitism in the world, just as there are all varieties of bigotry. But let's just blurt out the obvious. Virtually all of the alleged anti-Semitism we hear about from the Zionists is a lie smears calculated to silence anyone who seeks to end the horror. And this abuse of the charge of anti-Semitism, this exploitation of Judaism to silence those seeking peace is profoundly anti-Semitic. Meanwhile, as we are seeing more bluntly than ever in the United States, true anti-Semitism is embraced by Zionists because it is invariably pro-Israel. 100 years ago, Edwin Montague accused the British government of anti-Semitism for embracing Zionism. History has proven him correct. If Israel is denied this abuse, the conflict will be seen for what it is, and so could not continue. Israel-Palestine will become a democratic, secular country of equals, and what better year than the Balfour Centennial for that to happen? Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. I thought that was. Uh, it, it is, uh, you would like to speak? Yeah. But what I'm sorry I took up so much time, but would you no, like no, offer, to? No, no, I was going to have questions uh, to you, and then offer will talk after that. That's okay. if, if anybody has any points to make that they'd like to make, jump at the back. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for this interesting uh, debate. Now, uh, you mentioned that, uh, that uh, Jew Jews were uh, not willing to help the Allies during the Second World War. Uh, what about the uh, role of the Jewish Legion? as I understand, took part in uh, during the Second World War. The, the, actually, the term the Jewish Legion dates back to 1917, which was a, an earlier attempt. You're probably thinking of the Jewish Brigade? Yes. That's okay. The Jewish, what happened was this. The 
the Jewish agency only wanted Jews to join the Allied effort if it ser served the Zionist cause. And the way it would serve the Zionist cause is if it were a segregated Jewish army that would accomplish two things. One, it would be used as a de facto acknowledgement of Jewish nationality and therefore a so-called Jewish state. And two, in the meantime, in the process, it would have the Allies better train the Zionist militias to be better able to take over Palestine by force when they returned. Now, the Jewish agency was pushing this for years. And finally, in the summer of 1944, under intense pressure from the United States, Churchill approved this. But the, uh, this was considered by the, uh, the British military to be counterproductive. They said that to have a, a segregated Jewish army was inefficient. It only made our lives more difficult. And as they pointed out, Jews served in the Allied forces along with everybody else. But it was only for political reasons that the Jewish agency tried to stop Jews from enlisting until it could be as this segregated army. Thank you. Any more points? Lenny. <clears throat> that was interesting. Uh, a lot of points there, some of the material I didn't know. But there's a, a few questions I'd uh, like to ask. Can when you make you it two? What? Can you make it two Three. questions? One, one question, two, two and a half. points. <laughs> so, uh, when did you say that Arab terrorism started? It, the, uh, okay, this, you get into the question of what one calls terrorism, but certainly by the late 20s. Yeah. Certainly by the late 20s. Okay, late 20s, 1929, the massacre in, uh, in Hebron. Hebron, yeah. Yes. Uh, but also, I think it started in 19, 19, around 1920. Okay. But, okay. Now, you said that uh, the Zionist entity, Israel, uh, destroyed the communities in Iraq in the early 50s in order to facilitate uh, immigration to Israel. Yes. But I don't know if you're aware, but in 1943, there was a very serious pogrom, a series of pro pogroms in Iraq called the Farhud where many Jewish communities were destroyed, uh, many Jews were killed. Uh, do you mean there was 19, a lot of violence. Do you mean 1941 or 43? Uh, 41. 41. 41. 41, yeah. Okay. What I have found, I, now that may well be true. This, that does not contradict what happened later. But what I have found is this. At the time, at the time, in 1941, there were Jews in Iraq that claimed that it was a British false flag operation. And funny enough, Lehi, the Stern Gang, also claimed this. And I had declassified in the National Archives in Kew a document which, which I was interested about because of this issue. Now, now although they, they declassified the document for me, it's heavily redacted. So I cannot prove anything. But what is not redacted strongly suggests that this pogrom in Iraq was a British false flag operation intended to provide an excuse for the British to come back and rule. Well, I haven't seen the material, so I can't comment. Read that. the book. <laughs> okay, <laughs> one, uh, another point. Uh, tell me, another, uh, one uh, last uh, point. Uh, do you uh, believe the uh, version that uh, the Irgun warned the King David that it was going to be an explosion? First of all, I consider the question irrelevant. I mean, if you're going to blow up a hotel, you can't, you, you can't start making excuses. But as far as the question goes, I, a few things. If, if you make a warning like this, it's, let's say they did, it's only credible if you don't make a lot of false warnings. And the Irgun was notorious for false warnings. So the, the British probably got these calls all the time, and they were rarely correct. The other thing is that at the same time the British claimed to be making these phone calls, they staged a decoy attack outside the hotel. Now, if your point is to attract attention to the fact that there were these bombs in the basement of the hotel, why would you stage a decoy attack? The third thing I will say is that I know a survivor of the attack who knew some of the telephone operators. He claims there were no warnings. But again, morally, I, morally, I don't consider it a defense. <laughs>
Okay. <coughs> the, the young uh, woman who made the three bo uh, phone calls, Adina Chai Nisan, was my erstwhile mother-in-law. <coughs> she made one, true, one phone call uh, to the King David, one to the French, what was then the French embassy, right. which is now the French consulate in uh, Botta Street, opposite. Yes. And the Palestine Post uh, in uh, Kikar in Zion Square, which was destroyed in, uh, which was destroyed at one point or another. And uh, she made the phone calls. So okay. You know, Did she do this because she was, a, as an Ergun member, she, she hated the Ergun, idea she of killing an, people? She was an Ergun member, and she was given uh, instructions to phone the King David to warn them of the impending explosion. What, one, one question. The, the British ignored the warning and they wouldn't let, they locked 91, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, 91 people in a room saying, you know, this is uh, bullshit, what uh, we're being told, and these 91 people died. Question. If the intent was not to kill anybody, why did they do it during lunch hour? Why didn't they do it at 3 o'clock in the morning? They gave a... a Warnings were given. The idea was that uh, people would be e evacuated and the damage would be to the building and not to the people. Doesn't answer the question though. Why wasn't it done at three o'clock in the morning? Why would do it at the most populated time? I wasn't there at the time, I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I, okay, thank you, Tom. I would say one thing, which is that. Um, because it's really worth pointing out that this book looks thicker than it is because there are so many notes and so many references. And when it came out in the UK, the, the only sort of critical response from, from Zionists was that it was all lies, but it, it is one of the best referenced books I've ever seen. I think he has produced a thoroughly sustainable and new account of that period. So, Tom, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.